Welcome to a new episode of My Dear Kitchen in Helsinki podcast. My guest today is Pia Jallinoja, a professor of health sociology at the University of Tampere. Pia and I talked about how and why veganism and vegetarianism are increasing in the world and Finland. We also talked about an exciting vegan Facebook group from Finland, Sipsikalia Veganit, Crisp and Beer Vegans, and how a new wave of veganism is bending the common perceptions about vegans. Pia has two interesting questions for you in the end. We look forward to reading your answers as a comment on social media. Hope you enjoy our discussion. As always, special thanks to my dear friend Ufuk Evjuman for the sound editing. Hi, Pia, and thanks for uh, doing this interview. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about veganism and vegetarianism in general, but also specifically in Finland. Uh, but before we delve deeper into these topics, can you introduce yourself a little, your academic background, current position, research interests, and so on? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. So my name is Pia Jallinoja. I'm professor of health sociology at the University of Tampere, Faculty of Social Sciences. So uh, I'm a sociologist and I have been working at both at universities and at research centers, such as Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. So that's kind of my professional background. And uh, currently I'm interested in all kinds of topical areas and phenomena related to health and eating, mm-hmm. and especially the relation between health and food and eating, mm-hmm. also sustainability. But health has main, main, maybe been the main focus in my career. So I'm interested in what I call health scene or health markets mm-hmm. that's composed of various actor groups such as commercial sector, all kinds of healers, and hmm. and uh, also public sector and the media, mm-hmm. social media and print media. Mm-hmm. And uh, for a good part, I have also been interested in the tension between scientific expertise on the one hand and experience-based knowledge on the mm-hmm. other hand. So these kind of discussions between these two uh, types of knowledge okay so so and recently i've been studying for example the recent rise of veganism Mm. as a cultural phenomenon and during the corona pandemic i I have also analyzed uh, corona covid19 related attitudes Mm -hmm. and trust in experts Okay, yeah, that sounds very interesting, especially, of course, the corona part uh, is creating a lot of changes and, and uh, interesting. I, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of research made on this certain time. Uh, but uh, I want to start with veganism. But before that, I want to ask you a personal question. What is your personal dietary choice and what is a healthy diet for you as, as Pia? Well. I guess I don't have any special diet. I don't like follow anything strictly. Mm-hmm. I enjoy food. I follow food innovations and new cuisines and traditional cuisines because of my work, but also because they just interest me. They have always interested in me and I enjoy good food and restaurants and cooking myself. So, so that's kind of overarching thing for me. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I think about health uh, aspects, but also sustainability aspects in food. But they are not like something that I think all the time. So mm-hmm. I go combine pleasure and sustainability and health mm-hmm. and hopefully relax the attitude also to food. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So let's go to veganism. Uh, now, as you said, there is a, a rise, an increase in veganism. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, which do you think is the driving group uh, in, in, the, in this increase of veganism? Is it the consumers or organizations or the market or a combination of some sort? 
yeah, it's a combination of all kinds of things. And, and uh, of course, there has been vegetarian and vegan movements and waves and rise of vegetarianism before or already in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So this is not a new phenomenon. And, and, uh, and as regards veganism, like, for example, in the 90s, the um, animal rights activists were proposing vegetarian, uh, uh, vegan eating. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, so there has been previous uh, waves also. But the, the current interest in increased in interest in veganism, I think that the, the climate change and related discussions in the media mm -hmm. was the kind of uh, final kind of impetus for the new interest. Yeah. Also, of course, the animal rights activism. But, but there, there's things happening in the world and how they are presented in the media. They gave the rise. But so it's the consumers that got interested, but it's also all kinds of activists and also the food industry and restaurants and cafeterias mm. who, who have been kind of developing new products and providing them in their restaurants and cafes and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd like, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of uh, this, this type of uh, vegan, what, what we could say maybe substitutes uh, in the market nowadays, yeah. kind of products that I see increasingly, yeah. where you can find in any market, uh, not just one specific market. So, uh, but then one thing you said was uh, about you know the the, the the how how much more it, it's it represented in the media and all, and also in one of your articles, you uh, you write about the extensive use of social media to promote yeah. veganism. Um, can you explain explain your findings on this a little? The, incre the, the effect of social media? Yeah, well, I think that social media, internet and uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that, all kinds of uh, discussion forums in the internet, they are the kind of infrastructure for all new phenomena. It's not just veganism. It doesn't mean that things only happen in the internet, but uh, it's the channel where things are... Uh, Accumulate and where people discuss and uh, spread innovations and ask questions and so on. So, so, so in that way, it's important in, in all new phenomena. Yeah, well, in, in, uh, internet is the infrastructure of all new phenomena. So, I, I would say, and and uh, there are lots of examples of uh, vegan you know, challenges or pledges in the internet. Uh, podcasts, uh, blogs, food bloggers, food uh, vloggers, uh, and spread of new products in uh, uh, discussion forums or Facebook groups, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's a lots of activity going on in various platforms. And sometimes it's, of course, like, for example, vegan fairs, festivals. Yeah. They are live happenings happening somewhere in some building but it's also important what's said about these happenings online in uh internet forums and twitter and so on mm -hmm. so so that's the way how it's important previously it was more print media in yeah. the earlier earlier phases of uh, uh, vegetarian rise of vegetarianism in North America and Europe. It has been more print media or ta ta uh, all kinds of posters on walls and, and meetings and clubs and cookbooks and restaurants and so on. And they also exist nowadays, but now we have this amplifier internet that makes everything faster. Yeah, and also, I mean, I'm a, I have been a food blogger, not a vegan uh, specifically, but uh, a vegetarian uh, food blogger. Since 2013, and I can see myself how, how what a vast network I can reach with just one post that I write all over the world. So of course, uh, it's yeah. immensely uh, important. Um, now, one thing that is that I want to talk about veganism is something that I talked before uh, in the second episode of this podcast with also with uh, Kadri Avik uh, when we talked about veganism and gender, how veganism veganism or uh, plant-based eating diets and also as a lifestyle itself uh, is a political mm. act. And I think mm. food itself is political in any way. Uh, but how do you define 
uh, vegan and plant-based uh, eating and, and also everything related to that uh, as political consumerism? Well, if we uh, define political consumerism as something where consumers try to make an impact on markets by their consumer choices, mm -hmm. then it is political consumerism. Of course, it's a bit debatable whether if somebody is following vegan diet just because it looks cool and trendy or, or because of health reasons. Mm -hmm. so, so probably there are, or, or certainly there are vegans uh, or at least part-time vegans who follow vegan diet and who don't have any political aims. They just want to feel good or, or be trendy persons or they, they love to post nice avocado bread pictures in their Instagram page. So, so that, may not, that probably doesn't contain a political aim compared to those who follow vegan diet and want to have an impact on uh, climate policy and uh, the conditions of uh, animals mm -hmm. in, in farms. So, so in that way it differs, but, but, uh, but still even those who don't have any political agenda there, they might eventually be part of this kind of political uh, consumer movement. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, the idea is that through through consumption choices, uh, citizens might have an impact on how things are more generally. Mm -hmm. um, now, it is again, uh, you also write in in one of your articles. But also, if we think about veganism and vegetarianism at its core, without all the other things, well, it's 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 challenging meat eating. Uh, and uh, I'm curious, how has uh, the culture of uh, meat eating changed over the centuries? And yeah. today, what is the major reason why meat, eating, meat, eat, meat eating is challenged? Yeah, well, if we look at the history through centuries, we can see that uh, uh, like uh, until uh, Second World War, I would say, the meat, proportion of meat in diet among most of the populations was very small compared to what it is now because meat was expensive and most people ate like uh, bread and porridge and uh, all kinds of um, uh, vegetables. Uh, so meat was, uh, it was more, it was not perhaps luxury product, but it was consumed mu much less compared to what's it consumed now. Mm -hmm. So in that way, meat hold through those uh, centuries, meat also hold a position or kind of place in our food culture that it's something that we want to have because it's, uh, uh, it's more expensive and you can't buy it so often. So, so it holds that kind of connotations. But uh, then some researchers use this term meatification. So there has been a meatification of cultures in the, during the 20th century, especially after the Second World War, when uh, uh, all, all um, even, even those, not maybe poor, but those with less income could buy cheap meat and sausages and all kinds of meat products mm -hmm. relatively cheaply. Mm -hmm. So meat was not anymore as such a luxury product. Of course, there are always more expensive meats and not everybody can uh, eat fillet every day mm -hmm. and so on. But, but it, it, suddenly the cultural position, what it, it's still great for, but it became more everyday product compared to what it was like 60 years ago or 100 years ago and so on. Uh, but now during the past maybe 20 years, the, this cultural position of meat as something to be craved for has been challenged seriously from various sources, from the health promotion perspective, especially the red meat, mm -hmm. and then climate change, uh, environmental issues, all kinds of environmental issues, and then the animal rights activists. So, so the, the, the high cultural position of meat is like shaking a bit but I think that it still holds a central position in our food culture. Mm -hmm. uh, my, um, my ideas about uh, meat eating, meat consumptions, uh, is when, when after started after I read Carol Adams' Sexual Politics of Meat, 
Uh, and uh, there was also, of course, the gender aspect uh, throughout the history in that. Mm. And so I want to ask also, do you think uh, this, this challenge against meat eating uh, mm. is somewhat related to the increasing challenge against uh, patriarchal hegemony in society also in general? Not ju- just today, of course, yeah. it's been challenging being challenged by the, the waves of feminism since uh, for about a hundred years or so, but uh, yeah. is it related? How do you think? Well, I think in that way they are related because uh, like um, 400 years or even more, and especially since the 60s, there has been lots of grassroots movements uh, that try to promote and, and make better the lives of various uh, minority groups. Uh, or groups that that haven't have so good position in societies, mm-hmm. women, disabled, homosexuals, uh, trans, uh, what would I say, w- uh, various e- ethnic groups, blacks, mm-hmm. uh, all various, very many groups. So in that way, it's, it's part of the same movement and, and animals are the next kind of uh, group to be liberated. Yeah. So, so in that way, it's part of the same broad movement where first some groups started to claim rights for, for example, women, and mm-hmm. then followed other groups and other groups and other groups. So, yeah, yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> now, my next question is about a certain type of veganism that I read about after I read your uh, latest article. Mm-hmm. But to come to that, first, I want to ask something. Uh, I read in that same article something about food positivity, this term, and I know about body positivity, but I didn't, I hadn't heard the, the specific term food positivity. And I, when I first read it, I thought that it uh, naturally is a component of body positivity, but I'm not sure. Uh, so if you can explain our listeners, what is body positivity and what is food positivity and how are they related? Yeah, body positivity refers to thinking that, uh, uh, or maybe I should approach this from the other angle. angle. Mm -hmm. In our societies, there is a lot of talk in media and and also among like health promotion people that uh, talk about food as a problem. So there is this kind of concerned discourse around bodies and food and all kinds of things that we do. So whether they are good for our health or whether they are bad for our health. So there is this concern discourse and food positivity and body positivity challenge this concern discourse. So they try to bring that even though a person is obese, they still can value their body and not hate it or think that our bod- my body is only a problem. Mm-hmm. It's only a problem for my health, but I can also also see it positively and and the same goes with food mm-hmm. like there's lots of concern talk about food about about nutrition and how much there is salt and how what kind of fats do we consume or is there enough fiber and do you eat this too much and this li- too little and and it's all in a way important that we that th- there is also this kind of information about health effects of certain foods Mm-hmm. But in addition, we also need discourses that promote the positivity of food and enjoyment and relaxed attitude to food and so that we shouldn't be concerned all the time about what we eat, but we can just eat and enjoy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and of course, there is one could broaden this even further that, uh, that because it's not only about food and body, but they might, I, I think that we have in our culture, in Western cultures, lots of concerned discourses about how to spend our times and do we watch you know, too much television or are we too much this or too much that and are we stressed too much and so on. So there's lots, all constant scanning about whether I'm doing good stuff mm-hmm. in my life. Mm-hmm. So maybe there should be positivity in all, all areas of life. Mm. more well i think um pandemic uh, solved it and we are now all watching netflix all the time so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um one thing that you said about this food positivity which is the enjoyment of food uh, is directly now connecting it to the to the next thing which is indulgent veganism now this is something 
that I heard for the first time as a as, as, as something. And I and it kind of broke my brain at first when I when I read about it because I, I'm a I'm a vegetarian, but I talked to a lot of vegans and I read about uh, veganism and a lot about the health aspects. Uh, not so much banging on your head, but you know, just talk a, a lot talk about mm. the health aspect. And then when I had a, read about this indulgence, it it was very interesting for me, a kind of fascinating topic. So so what is this uh, type this type of veganism? This is just indu- with, with yeah. indulgence and. How do you analyze it from the health aspect or should we analyze it from the health aspect? Yeah, well, that was a study that I, I made with a colleague, Minna Santaoja. And uh, it was actually first her idea that we all both knew about this uh, Facebook group, Crisps and Beer Vegans, Sipsikalia Veganit. And uh, her idea that was that we should analyze this, that it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and we define it as indulgent veganism. And there is also in the back this kind of uh, awareness of this concerned discourse over eating and bodies and health. That, uh, and also veganism and vegetarianism, because they have been practiced more often by women compared to men. And women have been also more broadly also among population, women are more concerned about health and welfare issues related to food compared to men. So so veganism and vegetarianism has been associated quite strictly with kind of very healthy eating and uh, uh, like limiting everything. So so this indulgent veganism is an interesting, interesting concept because it's on the other hand, it limits a lot because it, there is no animal-based products in that yeah. eating yeah. style of eating, but still it's indulgent, so it doesn't limit the because of health aspects the food. So it uh, allows all kinds of uh, gluttony eating, mm-hmm. if one could use that word, like not not be concerned about health effects all the time. Mm-hmm. And also on the on the crisps and beer vegan Facebook page. Also, this kind of concerned uh, environmental talk is forbidden. So uh, the organizers of the pages are not like, of course, they are concerned about climate change and animal rights and so on. Mm -hmm. But they propose the idea that people could just enjoy this kind of vegan food and not all the time be talking about environmental effects or or whatever. So Mm -hmm. just enjoy the food and that's Mm it. (laughs) Sort of like we can be us vegans are fun too kind of way. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it is interesting. And um, although, as I said, this is something quite new for me. And because I mean, as a blogger, especially very active on also Instagram, I get on my Instagram feed a lot of suggestions. Um, and most of the vegans, or almost all of the vegan blogs that I was uh, suggested by Instagram is all these, you know, healthy salad bowls or, or vegan versions of some other healthy foods and, you know, uh, lean buddies and things like that. So, so that's why uh, vegans themselves showing that, Hey, this, there is also, we we are also having fun. And, and this, this was very interesting, but I'm still, I think I should, that group that you said, Sipsikalia Vegan, it, of course, I immediately checked on Facebook what it is, and you can see their posts online, and, and um, I looked at photos and some some of the captions, and I do want to interview some people from that, also from the, uh, for, for the podcast, um, but I'm yet skeptical about some parts of it, maybe because I don't know that much yet. Uh, like, um, Yes, we talked about indulgent vegans showing, hey, veganism can be fun too, or we are having fun too. But what are, does it have any other bigger aims uh, about the changing in, in veganism ideals? Or uh, if there are, how long lasting do you think these effects of indulgent mm-hmm. veganism can be? Well, uh, um, as I said, those who are behind the pages, they have agenda in their like personal lives or 
they are not they they are concerned about climate change and animal rights and etc. And uh, uh, but the idea might be that uh, or is that if they want to pro when they want to promote vegan eating more broadly. Mm -hmm. It might be that it's more effective doing it in relaxed and inclusive way compared to uh, promoting vegan eating so, so that the newcomers are facing a very strict diet where you only can eat like um, uh, tofu and mm. lentils or something like that. Mm. So that it's more, attra more attractive to newcomers or those who are starting to think about vegan food that, okay, you can eat vegan food in many ways. And of course, one must say that uh, this Facebook page, uh, Crispin Beer, Beer Vegans, it's, the idea is not that anybody would eat only on that way. Yeah. It's just one aspect and bringing a new kind of idea about or broader, broadening the idea of what vegan food can be. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's a kind of, it could be that, that it's a political act that they they make it more uh, approachable, vegan eating more approachable to newcomers be because it can be all kinds of things, not only very healthy food. Mm -hmm. So they are breaking the, or trying to break the uh, traditional image of plant-based and vegan eating as, as something very feminine and something very light and something very healthy and something very concerned about everything all the time. Mm -hmm. So in that way, and but you ask about, uh, how long its eff effect can be. Well, in this world today, with all the uh, bloggers and bloggers and uh, news media and uh, everything, Twitter and so on, so I don't think that any any Facebook page can have a massive impact. Mm. So it's just one in a big bowl of all kinds of ideas and suggestions and so on. And together they might have a positive impact on sustainability. Yeah. And my uh, prediction is that uh, things, uh, that it probably starts to vanish or lose its kind of uh, uniqueness at some point, because mm -hmm. there comes new, new phenomena comes and new interest and somebody builds a new page and so on. So it's part of the, kind of life cycle of any any uh, new phenomena, especially in the internet era. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's a kind of a negative thing or something that uh, there shouldn't be like aim that this page should go on for centuries because yeah. that's not life. Life is mm -hmm. like all new phenomena comes and all die or, or then old ones transform to something else. So mm -hmm. it's just normal. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that, uh, well, first of all, when I first um, read it and when I first checked checked it, uh, the, the Facebook group and anything else, I thought I thought at first that they are just eating those. So that was that was for me. That's why, like, why, how? I mean, yeah, it is maybe healthier than the non-vegan versions. But can, would you always eat snacks and stuff? And then I realized <laughs> what it actually yeah. means that it's not all the time. It's just just about that. But one thing I liked a lot about uh, that that group, especially, is that there is how inclusive they are, and that that and not just for the Facebook group, but as a wave of veganism in general. That kind of yeah more inclusive and uh, sort of indulgent veganism. I don't know, yeah. maybe it might have a potential uh, because of the inclusiveness uh, to extend yeah. more and to lead to a more yeah. sustainable food future. Uh, but it was good that we talked about this Facebook group in Finland because we come to the second part of the um, podcast, which is the situation in Finland. Um, yeah. So what is the percentage of vegans and vegetarians in Finland? And how did this change over the years, according to our findings? Well, well, it has been, there has been some rise in number of vegetarians and vegans since the latter part of the uh, last decade, mm -hmm. uh, but also first I should say that uh, when when questioners ask people, consumers, citizens, 
do you follow some special diet? And then they have the options, vegan, vegan, vegetarian, uh, flexitarianism, or whatever, low carbohydrate diets and so on. So what people answer in, in surveys, it's uh, not necessarily the right figure. So there's no way of finding a cor- perfectly correct correct number of how many how many percent what kind of percentage of teens follow vegan or vegetarian diet so that's impossible so so but but there are some guesses and I, I guess that they if if I look at the data that I have then it's something like uh, vegetarians are something a bit over four percent of Finns and vegans something around two and a half percent or three percent of Finns would follow vegan diet. It might be a bit less because in this service, uh, young men, for example, don't ask or answer as eagerly that, than uh, women, for example, and so on. Mm. So, 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 and then the, there are, in addition to vegan and vegetarian diets, there are those who report that they don't eat red meat. Mm-hmm. So that percentage is something around six percent of the Finns, and uh, so, and in 2020, we when we I have this data on this survey, it's something like 16 percent of Finns follow some of the plant-based diets that are at least one of the plant-based diets that are included in the survey. So maybe that tells something about it that it's not at all like majority of Finns, but. Mm-hmm. But but it's a consider, considerable group of consumers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. still. And it has been slightly rising. Maybe mm-hmm. that's also important to know that since ni- uh, 2016, mm-hmm. it has been steadily rising a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about this, when we are saying in Finland, are we talking mm-hmm. about Finland as a whole or are there some, if you know, regional differences mm-hmm. and so on? Yeah, that's an important question. This was about whole of Finland, adult population, adults, mm-hmm. or from the 60, uh, 15 years to 64 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it's uh, if, if we look at age groups, it's younger who are following more all these diets. And it's especially visible in vegan diet that younger age groups are following more. Women are more following these diets. And in Helsinki area, South Finland, Tampere, Turku, big big cities in the south, the difference is big compared to Helsinki and the countryside in northern Finland. So that's maybe those are the major major kind of uh, associations. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have uh, information about the motivations of people? I mean, why in Finland? Why do I mean? Is it more environmental or animal rights or health or something yeah else. well i don't have data on on finland but some some data from elsewhere from europe and i, I guess that that the results would be quite similar in finland compared to some switzerland or where where i i see some studies from switzerland mm-hmm. where especially vegans are motivated by avoiding animal suffering and environmental protection uh, but then the vegetarian diet has been traditionally more, or the health motive has been more important for vegetarians traditionally. But nowadays also, uh, one could say that, uh, and of course, they use animal products, so I don't know how, how much vegetarians are motivated by animal suffering, mm-hmm. but in, environmental protection. Mm-hmm. So there's a big difference between vegans and vegetarians mm-hmm. in this re- this respect. Uh, I mean, I'm a vegetarian and I've been, well, I mean, officially vegetarian since 2018, but until I officially declared myself to the world as vegetarian, I was already not eating meat. Uh, but it's because for me, it's always, I've always been a vegetable uh, lover. And I always had problems with eating the texture of meat, the, the, the smell of meat. So I was always a bit repulsed by uh, yeah. meat. But I think uh, if I were still living in Turkey, I'm not sure if I would uh, even think of declaring myself a vegetarian or not. Even though, of course, there are vegetarians in Turkey and there is a lot of beautiful, uh, amazing vegetable dishes in Turkish cuisine 
it's not just kebabs and doners and whatever. Um, but I think I found a bit more uh, easier to 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 find my vegetarian identity sort of in 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 Finland when I when most of my friends that I met after coming here, Finns or sometimes also coming from other uh, countries themselves they said that oh they are vegetarian and it's more maybe talked about in in my circles at least it was in at school yeah. also so i think that helped me uh, more and and i thought that when i became vegetarian when i said to myself yes i'm a vegetarian i felt like a relief almost like i will never i will not be offered meat again even <laughs> um, yeah but but vegan is a bit of a different thing because I love cheese and yogurt, so I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And uh, and what a change that has happened is is that uh, vegetarianism and even veganism is it at least in big cities and South Finland uh, has become not mainstream, but it's not weird anymore. So that's one thing that has been big change is that it's especially veganism was considered until quite recently, like very weird diet of very weird people. Mm-hmm. And there's not much understanding towards that kind of uh, pickiness about food that why don't you, why can't you eat food that everybody has always eaten? Mm-hmm. So, so now I guess that there is much more understanding but because there are lots of other special diets too, like low carbohydrate diets and uh, diets for kiliakia or various mm. allergies and so on. So there's a list of various diets that people follow. So I guess in Finland, we are now quite used to that uh, if somebody's organizing a party, for example, or some work related occasion, mm. like a seminar or something like that, always the special diets are inquired. So, so it's not like a big deal if somebody reports that I follow the vegan diet. Yeah. And even now, if somebody comes to our home, I ask, do you have any allergies or anything that you don't eat? And we are always asked. So, so because there is so much things that people, people either can't eat because of medical reasons or they follow something. So, so it has been in that way be- become more normal that, yeah. True. And I do, uh, as a food entrepreneur, I do, uh, at least until COVID, I did a lot of uh, catering gigs. um, And increasingly, I was asked, uh, not just vegetarian, because my menus are by default vegetarian, uh, but also specifically vegan food. And um, I've seen the increase over since I've done this since 2015. And I've seen the increase. Mm -hmm. And um, also, even when they don't ask specifically, like any food is yeah. okay for us, I tell uh, them the things that I offered, if they are vegan I, or, or gluten-free, I tell. And they are surprised to find that, well, vegan yeah. food is a normal food, <laughs> even if they yeah. don't ask specifically. So I think there's a lot of change happening, even in even that I could see personally. Um, but what I want to talk about next is ethical consumption in food uh, and I have a specific question about that but before that can you de- explain to the listeners what ethical food consumption is well it's food consumption buying and consuming food when while well taking into account various ethical aspects so these ethical aspects might be related to animal suffering animal rights or animals conditions uh, or environmental issues, but also like uh, working conditions mm. on farms and in factories and all kinds of. I, I would say that maybe it's something related to sustainability because sustainability sustainability is also an overarching concept covering all kinds of conditions on farms and and in factories and and then environmental consequences and so on. So it's it's probably a bit similar to that. Mm-hmm concept now my specific question is about barriers this is something that i'm very interested in when it comes to anything related to food and barriers because all kinds of barriers in different aspects of food makes us leave some people behind when it comes to food system and food related issues so my question is what are 
do you think the barriers for some people or some communities in Finland to consume food more ethically? And how can this be addressed? Mm. Well, one thing that has been a barrier and still is, is the fact that I referred to earlier, is the uh, what kind of ideas people have of plant-based foods or meals, vegan meals or vegetarian meals. If they consider if their image of the vegan meal is like tasting terrible or being boring or doesn't taste anything or not being filling or in it doesn't contain enough energy and so on. So, so that's the first barrier if the image is too negative. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, for example, that uh, they don't know how to cook uh, ve vegan meals. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to cook uh, uh, edible, good tasting vegan food or, or they don't have access to or they don't know how to buy proteins, mm -hmm. those foods that uh, replace uh, dairy, dairy or egg or, or meat. Mm -hmm. So that kind of quite practical things also. also of course, nowadays that has been for a good part been not so big problem any anymore because we have all these uh, replacement foods like uh, like vegan dairy food or and and meats uh, pulled oats and all kinds of stuff. But of course, for many people, they are not enough. They are still there. It's the there is still this barrier because they are not exactly the same as like beef or minced meat or chicken. So they are almost there but not yet so so that still is a barrier to many mm -hmm. and then one thing that for example about food culture and the position of uh, meat in our our cultures uh, meat is still considered very special and like a valuable ingredient to be provided to guests if organizing a dinner at home mm -hmm. I think that majority or good part of Finns still think that you should offer them meat not uh, lentil mm -hmm. patties or something like that but i think that that's also changing among younger generation yeah so that it's it's valuable also to uh have a dinner vegetarian dinner as, and still be considered uh, as polite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh i think that kind of barriers are taste is something very important thing that you if 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 like a in a, a workplace canteen, there are different meals, and if if the vegetarian or vegan option is always tasting bad, mm -hmm. then people don't choose chooses if they are not like uh, committed vegans. Mm -hmm. So I think taste is something very important. Taste and the image and the and the capacity to prepare tasty vegan food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, my next question is something that you can uh, answer as your personal recommendations. If you have any data based on your researches, you can also, of course, uh, talk about that. But um, when you become, well, we, we talked a lot about this, but uh, when you become, especially vegan, not even vegetarian, uh, you sometimes need to learn new things like eating, learn to eat, learn what to eat, what to cook uh, from, not from scratch, but uh, you have to learn quite a lot, especially if you are, if you have these health concerns and if you think, what am I, from what am I going to get my protein, for example. Uh, we know that it's not so much of a problem in vegetarianism because we can get our protein with dairy products and so, and so on. But, but there is plant-based proteins that vegans have to um, rely on and they should find out about those things. Uh, now, there can be among the listeners right now, uh, people who are considering to become vegan or who have just become and, and are like thinking about all these things. Um, what is, do you think, is the best way to get the information? I mean, you can go to, onto the internet you can find anything on the internet, but there's so much information and information pollution also on the internet. Yeah. Um, so what do you recommend these um, newcomers or people thinking uh, about where to get the best information? Well, I, I, I haven't like scanned all the pages and so on. So there might be good options, many good options, but 
I would start from the pages of Veganiliitto, the association, vegan association in Finland. Mm-hmm. And they have this vegan challenge, Vegani Haaste. I, I don't know if it's now yearly or is it through throughout the year. Mm-hmm. But in those pages and in Vegani Haaste pages, they have collected all kinds of uh, recipes and information about how to how to build a, build a nutritious vegan diet, mm-hmm. what kind of protein sources do you have to use, and etc. I would start from there. But uh, also, of course, all kinds of bloggers and bloggers might be good sources because they also, because it's not, not only about nutrition, it's also about enjoyment and uh, having various options and uh, and giving getting ideas and so on. So, But I would get the information first from Vegan Elito and then follow all kinds of interesting bloggers and bloggers. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so these are all my questions. Um, do you have any final uh, comments and what is maybe one question that you would like to ask yourself to our listeners uh, for them to think uh, further after listening to this uh, episode? Well, I don't know. I was thinking about the questions and I have actually two questions that could be interesting to know about people. First, what is your first food memory? Mm. And the second is, what is your first memory about vegan food? Mm. Mm. Kind of what, what is it about and how did you feel? What kind of things do you associate, it, associate, it, associate with the memory? Yeah. Oh, this is this is interesting. I'm going to think a lot about that myself too. Yeah, and and yeah, and people can answer to this question or write their comments in social media wherever they see uh, this episode post related to this episode. But thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, It was a lovely, and I learned, especially, I mean, I read uh, quite a lot of uh, your articles and I learned quite a lot. Uh, I, I love studying for these uh, episodes because then I learn also myself a lot. Uh, so thanks a lot. And uh, I hope to uh, talk with you at some point again in the future related to food and such. And, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for inviting me and it was nice to talk with you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want to know more about the blog behind this podcast, check out www.mydearkitchenhelsinki.com and find it also on Instagram and Facebook. Have a delicious week.